Well, church family, would you turn in your Bibles now to Daniel chapter 6. Let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 6 for the message. And I want to welcome our radio listeners and internet listeners. As you're turning in your Bible there, I want to tell you a little story. It's a story about a pastor, the pastor of a big city church one day ran an ad for a caretaker, a caretaker housekeeper position. The next day, a well-dressed young man appeared at the pastor's door, the pastor's office. But before he could say more than, hello, I came to see about, the pastor began questioning him. And the pastor said to him, can, can you sweep? Can you make beds? Can you shovel walks? Can you run errands, fix meals, balance a checkbook, and babysit? The churchman asked. Whoa, the young man said. I only came to see about getting married, but if it's that much work, I'm not interested. <laughs> All right. Let's read our scripture, please. Uh, Daniel chapter 6. This is part of the life of Daniel. Chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, says, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in, in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about the law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion, into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied, that decision stands. It is an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Verse 13. Then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. 
A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles, so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. Verse 19. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, Long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. He had trusted in his God. As we have been studying this part of the Holy Bible that we know as Daniel and some of the chapters here in Daniel, we've been discovering some wonderful characteristics in Daniel's life, characteristics that, that as you and I plan to live them out and experience them, we become more of what God wants us to be. And in the first uh, three messages, I shared with you the, some of those characteristics. Now today, we want to give focus to the specific truth I'm about to announce to you. And I've called this series, What I Wish For You. And today, I wish the following for you. Be self-disciplined. Be self-disciplined. This truth uh, came to my mind out of verse 10, where we read, But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down, as usual, in his upstairs room, with, with its windows open toward Jerusalem. Here it is. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Now, those of you who were here last Sunday know that this was the second point in my message last week, and I only got to a certain, um, uh, to a certain distance in it. Uh, after church, after church, someone spoke to me and said, Pastor Nick, uh, there are so many other areas where we have to apply self-discipline. And I said, for sure, but I had to stop where I did because of time concerns. So I'm just going to briefly review a few of the things that we spoke of in the message last week and then continue on, okay? But as we think of verse 10 here, obviously this verse tells us that uh, Daniel prayed. He prayed three times, it says, but, but what else indirectly is it telling us? Well, it's telling us that Daniel was very disciplined, right? Daniel was very disciplined. What is the definition of self-discipline? Well, I read a definition that I think accurately explains to us what is self-discipline. And uh, here it is on the screen. I gave it to us last week. But here is, a, I believe, a good explanation of, of self-discipline. Read it out loud with me. Self-discipline is a pattern of behavior where you choose to do what you should do rather than what you want to do. It is the assertion of willpower over more basic desires and is synonymous with self-control. I especially like the first part there where it says, Self-discipline is a pattern of behavior where you choose to do what you should do rather than what you want to do. Now, since last week, I found another definition that gives us some added uh, information here, very similar to what we just read, but I think it just kind of 
further fills in the picture, okay? Read it out loud. Another definition. Self-discipline is the ability to control your impulses and be able to make yourself do things that need to be done. This can sometimes mean turning down instant gratification in favor of long-term gain and satisfaction. So would you agree with me that these two statements are a very good summary of um, self-discipline? Would you agree, Mr. Ray? Good, thank you. All right. Is, dis is discipline important in life? Well, of course it is. The most uh, successful people in life exert discipline on a daily basis. And we have to ask the question, how disciplined? How disciplined are you and you and you and you dear folks up in the balcony, radio listeners, how disciplined are you and am I? Now, in the previous message, I briefly shared with you uh, about uh, how we need to be disciplined in the following areas. Number one, prayer. We need to be disciplined in the area of prayer. Number two, we need to be disciplined in the area of attending Sunday school and church services each Sunday. Number three, we need to be disciplined in the area of eating. And number four, spending our money, right? Who, who is really good at spending your money? Who? Anyone? <laughs> Listen, your daughter is very disciplined, dear mother, so <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. She just has to watch. She doesn't spend too much on shoes, that's all. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. So, uh, for those of you who weren't here, if, if you really want a full picture of what I spoke about in those first four points, you can go to the website and listen to last week's message. No charge, okay? Now, I want to continue on today and on this topic of self-discipline, self-discipline that uh, Daniel displayed so, so beautifully, not only in the scripture passage we read, but on other occasions as well. Let's talk a, a little bit about time management. Number five, for those of you making notes, all right? Number five, how, how we use our time is another area in our lives where we need to practice self-discipline. Now personally, I have to constantly wrestle with how to use my time. Remember the first part of the definition of self-discipline is this. We had it on the screen a little bit ago. Self-discipline is a pattern of behavior where you choose to do what you know you should do rather than what you want to do. Correct? Rather than doing what you feel like doing. All right. Well, in my case, for instance, I had, I had a very busy Monday through Thursday this week, and then on Friday of this week, uh, several of our other pastors and I officiated the funeral of our dear brother Horace Gross, and then in the evening I went to another funeral visitation for Saturday's funeral. And yes, yesterday on Saturday I offici officiated another funeral with a fellow pastor. And um, I went home to have supper with my wife. I had had a very demanding week. And the truth is, the truth is, after supper on Saturday evening, I, I was tired. And what I, what I really wanted to do, what I felt like doing, was to put my feet up and rest and maybe doze off. Although I usually don't doze off during the daytime, okay? That's what I felt like doing. I knew I couldn't do that because I still needed to finish my message for today. Self-discipline, self-discipline is a pattern of behavior where you choose to do what you know you should do rather than what you feel like doing or rather than what you want to do. Amen? And fortunately, last night I chose to do what I knew I should do 
which was to continue to work on my message. And probably some of you are thinking, well, Pastor Nick, you know, if you hadn't worked more on your message, then maybe it would have been shorter today. And uh, that's not too bad for some of you, right? And by the way, by the way, in telling you that, uh, I, don't mean, I don't mean it as a poor me story, okay, as a poor me story. In fact, I enjoy, I enjoy studying the Bible and working on my messages. There are simply many times in your life and mine where you and I have to choose to do what we know we should do rather than what we feel like doing. Isn't that true? All right. At least Pastor Lisa agrees with me. That's all I need. One person to agree with me. All right. In the last couple of weeks, we've had a lot of snowfall in Toronto. Many of you had to discipline yourselves to shovel the snow. I'm sure most of you would have preferred to spend your time doing other things, but you chose to shovel your driveway. Why? Because you knew, you knew Pastor Lisa wasn't going to do it for you. <laughs> right? Obviously, obviously, you wouldn't want Pastor Lisa shoveling your snow because she's, uh, she's very busy with her pastoral responsibilities. And as our associate minister, uh, she does a great job in our church here. But nevertheless, if she happens to be at your home and it's snowing, I venture to say that she'll be eager to pick up the shovel and help you. <laughs> All right? No matter who we are, let's be disciplined in how we manage our time. In saying that, I'm not suggesting... I'm not suggesting that you and I should always be working at our job or working at the church or uh, always working at home or in the community or wherever. The challenge is for each one of us uh, to find a balance, a balance between work, family time, fun time, serving the Lord, rest, and sleep. Correct? We have to find a balance. Time management. Another area of life where you and I have to constantly uh, apply self-discipline is at our job. This is number six, at our job or at school. Sometimes over the years, I've heard people say things like this. I've heard people say, well, if I don't feel like going to work, I, I won't go in. Have you heard that? Yeah. Or others will say, uh, if it's too cold outside, or it's too rainy, or if it's snowing too much, I just won't go to work. Most employers, I believe, are understanding if you miss work because you are truly sick, or because you have to stay home with a sick child, or with a sick elderly mom or dad, or some other dear family member. However, however, when an employer realizes you missed work because you didn't feel like going in or because you didn't want to brave the weather elements, I can tell you that soon you will probably lose your job. It'll happen eventually. Practice discipline in regards to your job. Now, those of you who are wonderful students, students in various schools, whether it's high school or university, be disciplined. Attend all your classes. Don't, don't skip classes. When I was in high school and university, I was really surprised and didn't make sense to me why such and such a person, this person, that person would say, well, I'm not going to go to class today. I'm going to skip that class. I'm going to skip that class. I thought, hey, it's harder to catch up when you miss all the classes. Why, why, why skip classes? Be on time, students. Students, be on time for your classes. Turn in all your assignments. Teens, are you good at turning in your assignments up there? Yep. All right, that's good, that's it, that's good, okay? Do the reading, do the reading that you are supposed to do. Take the quizzes and the tests the teacher 
or the professor gives you. Pay attention in class. Pay, pay, pay attention. Um, a, a few years ago, I was visiting, visiting one of the universities, one of the secular universities here in Toronto. I forget what I was there for. I was there for some responsibility. But anyway, uh, I, um, I thought, oh, I remember my university days, and I thought I would uh, just wander, wander into one of the big lecture halls where a lecture was going on and just kind of listen in on the topic for a few minutes. And so I, I wandered in, and uh, I think there were, there were probably, I don't know, 200 or 250 students in that lecture hall. So I, I was right at the back there trying not to disturb anyone, and I, I was really shocked. I was shocked because here was a professor at the front really presenting an excellent, excellent lesson doing his best and communicating very effectively. And what do I see? At the back, there were several students, had their computers out. From the front, the professor probably thought they were taking notes. But because of my location, I could see they were playing games on their computer. They were playing games. I wanted to go over to those students and say, young man, What's the matter with you? Either you or your parents are paying big money to be in these classes, and you're wasting your time playing games on your computer instead of listening and taking notes. You know what? I probably would have done that, except I didn't want to interrupt the professor, okay? Um, but, but you understand what I'm talking about, right? To our students here at Rosewood Church of the Nazarene, whether you're in high school, college, or university. Listen, when it's class time, give it your full attention. Don't play any games on your, on your computer or on your phone or, or, you know, don't be sending little notes between you and your buddies or whatever. Focus. Be disciplined, right? Be disciplined and uh, do what needs to be done, all right? If you are a student, be disciplined and give the necessary time and effort to your studies. Uh, most of you won't know this or you won't remember, but some, some years ago, some years ago, Colorado Springs Bible College had, a, had an extension school here in Toronto, and I believe we called it uh, Toronto Bible Institute. Right, Cindy? So anyway, uh, I happened uh, to be asked, they asked me to teach three different college courses to the students preparing to become pastors. And usually, usually I had, uh, I think, about eight to 20 students in those classes. And what I really appreciated about those courses was how, was how almost all of the students came to three-hour classes each week during the semester, and they came very eager to learn, eager to participate, eager to have done their homework and required reading and assignments. And, and by the way, our current district superintendent, Pastor Steve Otley, was one of my students in those classes, and I can tell you he was a wonderful student and did his work diligently. So, students, be like those students in those classes that I taught for, I don't know, two or three years, whatever it was. Be diligent and do your best. Amen? Here's another area we need to exercise self-discipline. It is in the area of, number seven, anger management. Anger management. Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27 reads as follows. Read it with me from the big screen, would you? And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Okay, just pause right there. Notice that. Anger gives a foothold to the devil. I mean, sometimes when you hear about some terrible things that happen or that were, that were carried out by 
a person or people that most would say, well, he or she was totally normal. What in the world happened? Well, here's the explanation. Okay, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Uh, let's put up the next verse as well. James 1.20. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Amen? Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Because you and I are human uh, beings, most of us will have times when we get angry. Right? There might, be, there might be one or two of you here who are just perfect and you never get angry. All right? I'd like to get to know you better. All right? But most folks get angry occasionally. Recently, I, I got angry over a situation. I, uh, I don't mean this in a proudful way, but I, I, I feel I am very self-controlled and I, I can control my anger. And fortunately, it's very, it's very seldom that I get angry. All right? But recently, I, I got angry over a situation. And you might think it's, this is weird, but I'm just going to tell it to you anyway, okay? I went to see a family in an apartment not far from here. This was just a few weeks ago. When I arrived at the apartment building, there were, there were a lot of people waiting to get on the elevator. Now, at first, I didn't think any big deal about it. There were a lot of people, and you know, I, I walked in, and I just started to talk to the people who were waiting in the lobby. I, at first, I thought maybe they were just you know, having a good time, and uh, so I just kind of joined in on the good time. I was, I was talking with them and so on. I, I didn't know them. They didn't know me, but that's okay. Wherever I go, I like to get to know people. So anyway, I was talking with them, and then, and then I kind of noticed. I kind of noticed that it, it sure, the line wasn't moving. The elevator just wasn't accommodating very many people and uh, wasn't coming down very often. And so after, after a while, I said to some of the folks who lived there, I said, I, I said, you know, uh, are there some other elevators down the hallway or something? And I, I saw two elevators, and I said, are there other elevators somewhere? Uh, no, sir, these are the only two elevators, and one of them is broke down. One of them is out of commission for, I think they said, six to eight months while it was being replaced. I said, there's only one elevator? Yeah, yeah, anyway, uh, I waited some more, some more, and. I didn't feel like going up the stairs because uh, the, the, the family I was going to see was on the 10th floor. Now, some of you, I'm sure, would have wanted to climb the 10 floors very, very quickly for exercise purposes, and some, you know, sometimes I might do that, but not on that occasion. Anyway, I finally, I finally got up to the 10th floor, and as I was talking with the family, I went to see. I, I, I said, you know, what, what's the situation with the elevator? Oh, Pastor Nick, um, one is broken down and they've got to replace it. And, and I said, is it true that there are only two elevators? Yep, there are only two and one of them hasn't worked for months and we're not sure exactly when it's going to start up again. And, uh, and, and what bothered me was, I, th I think... I think uh, the building has, it's either 14 or I think it's 15 f stories, okay? 15 stories. And I thought, only one elevator for 15 stories? And this is a big apartment, a big apartment. A and I started, George, George, I said to myself, isn't this crazy? Isn't this crazy? Whoever, whoever wanted to build this apartment building, they, they were content to have only two elevators, knowing that very often one elevator is out of commission for whatever reasons. But 30, 40 years ago, when this apartment building was built, they only put in two elevators. And then I thought, not only was the builder not only was the builder um, lacking in, in their plan for this building, but I thought the architects 
Any decent architect designing a building like that would know that, hey, with 15 floors and so many apartments on every floor, there's no way two elevators can handle the population. Especially when you know one of the elevators is going to be broken down on various occasions. So I thought, why in the world did the builder allow this to happen? Why in the world did the architects allow this to happen? And, and I thought, then I thought, you know what? Why in the world did our planning department and building, Scarborough Building Department, allow them to build this? Because before you build anything in our city, you have to get a building permit. You have to get approval from the city. You can't just build whatever you want. When we built our first uh, church structure on Alex Moore in 1982, we, we man, we, we, we had to bend over backwards to satisfy the building department before they'll allow us to build. When we built here in 2002, built the main structure, and then in 2008, added the balcony, uh, again, there were a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of things we had to jump through to satisfy all the requirements. And I thought, why in the world did the building department allow a building with only two elevators? That building should have at least four elevators and preferably six. Okay? Now, I know why. There's a lot of cost involved in elevators, okay? And there's cost in maintenance as well. Even with the one little elevator we have here, we, we have to spend several thousand every year just for the, the regular maintenance checkups and so on. But, but you know, I, I, obviously it was no big deal to me that I had to wait so long in that apartment building to go up and to go down and all that. So it was no big deal for me because I don't live there. But I, I felt angered because of how the dear people, hundreds of them, or maybe thousands, I don't know exactly how many live in that building, I was angered at, at, how, at how they were being mistreated. And it all started back 30 or 40 years ago when that building was first designed and built. And it really, really bothered me. It still bothers me. In fact, I wondered, I thought, what, what can I do that can help, that maybe can help the people in this building? And I thought of different options. And sadly, there was absolutely nothing I could do, which was very frustrating for me. All right? So I tell you that to say, sometimes, we have to discipline ourselves. I, I, I had to discipline myself to put aside my, my righteous anger. My righteous. I hope you don't mind me calling it that. I had to discipline myself to put aside my righteous anger over what I felt was, was careless mistreatment of people. Oh, and by the way, by the way, the Sunday after I, I was at that apartment building the Sunday after the gentleman was here in church and he said Pastor Nick this morning none of the elevators were working in our building you know my friends there will be times when you too have to discipline yourself with the Lord's help to put aside your anger your anger towards a family member a friend a stranger an institution. Amen? Here's another area of life we have to show discipline. Number eight. Read it out loud from the big screen. Watch what your mind is exposed to and what your mind focuses upon. <coughs> Philippians 4, 8 gives us beautiful instructions here. Read it out loud with me. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that lovely? My friends, there will be people who will try to get you to focus on gossip, Discipline yourself not to. Amen? There are, there are video games and electronic games, computer games, cell phone games, 
which are filled with extreme violence. Do your best to not allow your children and youth to play those games. Young people, stay away from those games. Stay away from violent, violent games yourselves. They can desensitize. They can desensitize a child, a teenager, or an adult. On a regular basis, we hear about someone who goes into a mall, a school, on a street, and starts shooting at people, often for no reason at all. Why? There are obviously several reasons, but somehow, somehow those shooters have become desensitized. Does that make sense to you? Right? They have become desensitized. Also, stay away, stay away from pornography, whether it's in magazines, your computer, your cell phone, or wherever. I was reminded yesterday of the importance of what goes into the minds of our children. Around 8 a.m. yesterday, just as I was getting ready to leave to come to the church to get in uh, at least for the first part of the prayer time, and also we had, I had arrangements to make regarding the funeral. Uh, but anyway, yesterday around 8 a.m., either our, our son, Jeremy, or perhaps it was his wife, I didn't ask which one, his wife, Kirby, sent us a little, <clears throat> a little video to our phones, a little video of our almost two-year-old granddaughter, Everly. They have, a, they have a camera in her room focused on her crib so they can monitor her from pretty much anywhere in the house. And uh, I don't know exactly how they do it, but somehow they can also video record. They can record her movements and whatever she says. Yesterday morning, my little granddaughter woke up singing Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now, as I listened to, looked at the image and listened to her singing, she, she had some difficulty pronouncing some of the words. But as I think of my little granddaughter singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, I'm reminded of the importance, I'm reminded of the importance of trying to fill our children's minds with what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable, excellent and worthy of praise. Amen? Watch what your mind and the mind of your child is exposed to. And then number nine, discipline yourself to remain committed to Jesus Christ. Discipline yourself to remain committed to our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 11 says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Serve the Lord enthusiastically. Let it be so. Let's pray. Dear Lord, may you help all of us to be like Daniel, disciplined, disciplined in so many areas of life. And through it all, dear God, help us to remain committed to you, committed to Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Through Christ we pray. Amen.